Well, hello everyone, welcome to the webinar. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to participate today and uh, just a little bit about the format before we hand it over to John. Uh, please remain on mute for the entirety of the presentation. Uh, regarding questions, the more the better. Please, please make sure they're related to the content and place them in the chat. John will be happy to answer your questions at the end of his presentation. Thank you. Uh, now for today's webinar, in two separate studies, you'll learn how John Ertl used leaf gas exchange analysis of lettuce plants to inform potential tip burn mitigation solutions and how chlorophyll fluorescence is affected by acute chilling stress of grafted and non-grafted watermelon seedlings. Uh, just a little bit about John. Uh, John Ertl is a PhD candidate and grad research associate at the, the Ohio State University, where he worked with Dr. Cherry Kubota for his uh, Master's of Science in 2020 and his PhD, which he'll complete this year, I'm sorry, next year, uh, specializing in applied research problems. Um, his master's in science uh, work explored um, abiotic stress tolerance of grafted fruiting vegetable crops, while his PhD focus uh, is nut on nutrient deficiency of lettuce grown in indoor farms. Uh, specifically, John's um, master's work evaluated risk associated with acute chilling stress of watermelon seedlings occurring, occurring during transportation that have the potential to, to delay post-transplanting development. Uh, during his PhD, he investigated the lettuce nutrient deficiency known as tip burn, which is problematic for indoor vertical farms. Uh, his research dealt with establishing standardized evaluations for tip burn risk, as well as designing physiologic, physi physiology-based uh, strategies to mitigate tip bird incidents for controlled environment growers. Um, as I said, John plans to complete his PhD in 2023, and he's planning the next steps of his career. So, um, John, I'll hand it over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Curly, and, and a big thanks to you guys for uh, organizing this webinar. Um, and I appreciate all the attendees for taking time out of your busy schedules to uh, come see some of my work. Um, so, uh, like Kerry said, I'm going to talk about two different projects, one that I uh, conducted during my master's and one during uh, my PhD, which is ongoing. Uh, so there will be some more results to follow uh, uh, after this presentation, but um, uh, let's get into it a little bit here. So there we go. Okay. So, uh, like I said, but my master's project was looking at acute chilling stress of grafted watermelon seedlings. Uh, and then during my PhD, I've been looking at mitigating tip burn of lettuce uh, for indoor vertical farm production. Um, and the way I'll, I'll, I have a label in the top left corner of the screen that's going to pop up and it's going to say uh, grafting or tip burn. Uh, and that's just to kind of separate those two projects so no one gets too confused. All right, so uh, grafting. Um, grafting is a unique agri-technology that uh, was first uh, invented somewhere in the uh, sixth century uh, uh, ACE, right, after common era now. So uh, grafting is essentially the, uh, you're taking two plants and you're merging them into one. So uh, we have a crop of interest. In this case, we're seeing a, a, an excised uh, watermelon uh, seedling here. And on the left, we have a squash seedling that has had the mare stem and the uh, growing tissues removed uh, just above the cotyledon. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're making cuts in the scion or the crop of interest and then the rootstock uh, to merge these plants into one transplant. Uh, we clip them together and we heal them for about a week uh, and under a high humidity, low light condition. And what this does is form these two plants into one singular transplant that you can then treat as any normal transplant would when you're transplanting into the open field or a greenhouse, et cetera. Uh, now, why would we do grafting in the first place? Uh, there's quite a few reasons. I'll just go through a few of them. Uh, the first is uh, reduced disease incidence. So we can see here that these are watermelon roots in the top, uh, uh, the top uh, two figures here, and they're infected with root knot nematode in a field grown condition. And on the bottom, we have two root systems uh, that are resistant to root knot nematode. Now, these uh, root socks uh, are what we want to take advantage of, their resistance to disease. And so we're able to plant them in the field and resist that uh, that certain uh, pathogen pressure. Um, you can see here on the right, this is a field infected with Fusarium wilt, and we have non-grafted watermelon on the right side, uh, and you can see it's not doing too well, uh, but we have grafted watermelon on the left side that's grafted onto a resistant rootstock, uh, and that plant is growing just fine, uh, and we have a very successful crop uh, with, that grafted, uh, with that grafting process. Another reason that we might graft is to increase yield. So 
by adding a different rootstock that has certain traits, like potentially a bigger root zone, a uh, stronger root system in general, uh, we can actually enhance the yield of the crop. And so we're pushing more and more of those nutrients and water and uh, assimilates up into the plant and we're improving the fruit set. So uh, you can see here just two different uh, tomato crops, one is grafted and one is non-grafted, and you can clearly see the difference uh, in what we might see in terms of yield. Um, now, it's always not so drastic, but uh, it's very location-dependent, environment-dependent, uh, uh, localized uh, sort of conditions can play a, lot, a big role in that, but uh, just to give an idea of what benefits we can gain from grafting. Um, here's just another example of field-grown watermelon in Arizona. We can see that there's two non-grafted varieties here and two grafted varieties. And uh, we can see that the non-grafted are yielding up to 3.3 kilograms per meter squared, um, but the grafted are somewhere between six and a half and eight kilograms per meter squared, which is a 97 to 140% increase in yield in just one field season, uh, which is a huge, huge improvement. It, it, like I said, it's not always so drastic that you have this kind of improvement. Um, it's very specific to those conditions, but um, these are the types of benefits that we are pursuing in the process of grafting. Uh, in fact, grafting increases yield uh, so much so in certain environments that uh, it's become a, an industry standard to use them in industrial uh, uh, commercial greenhouses um, that are producing tomato crops or other fruit, uh, binding fruit crops. Um, and we can see here that this is uh, uh, just um, you know rows and rows of these grafted transplants can also improve fruit quality with this type of uh, grafting. So we can see that uh, the grafted versus non-grafted fruit quality is higher in this, uh, in this figure. And this is a very common um, uh, result coming out of, uh, a common benefit uh, resulting from grafting. Now, grafting production in North America has historically only been over the last 20 or so years, um, starting in, uh, well, Today, we uh, produce about 58 million grafted transplants in North America. Um, the other value out of, of grafted transplants is for these commercial producers that uh, graft lots and lots of plants. They can sell these plants sometimes a dollar to a dollar fifty per transplant, which is a huge uh, uh, amount of money if you're buying tens or hundreds of thousands of these transplants from a commercial uh, grafter. Historically, um, most of the grafting has been done in small localized nurseries, but now we're seeing the advent of commercial nurseries that are producing tons and tons of these transplants annually. Um, about two thirds of the transplants produced in North America that are grafted uh, are tomato and about a quarter are watermelon, but that's been growing really quickly in the last few years. Around 2000, less than 100,000 transplants or grafted transplants were produced in North America. Um, now the asterisk here is because that's an estimate. There aren't really formal statistics, but based on the trend of the industry, this is. Uh, uh, whereabouts we think um, the number of transplant productions, uh, number of transplant production units are. By the year 2012, uh, about 47 million grafted transplants were produced in North America. Um, most of this uh, is between Canada and Mexico, and the US actually held less than 1% of that market share. However, up to 2019, when I conducted the survey, uh, evaluating the commercial uh, uh, grafting industry, we see that there's a 23% increase in the number of transplants produced annually. And uh, most of this is due to an enhanced market share of the US. Um, although Canada and Mexico have both increased their production, the US has taken a really firm hold of uh, producing more of these transplants uh, within uh, the states. Now, there are very few high volume grafting nurseries. High volume here meaning over a million transplants produced a year. Like I said, there are still localized grafting nurseries, but uh, if for a grower that wants to plant a large field, you might need tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of these transplants. And there are only a few high volume nurseries capable of meeting those demands. There are only a handful in the US. And so we rely on a lot of importation from Canada. Uh, Canada exports somewhere around 5.75 million tomatoes and 2 million watermelon grafted transplants annually. Um, and Mexico actually has, uh, uh, which, okay, sorry, that was a 38% of the Canadian grafts are sent here. The rest are mostly relegated to uh, Canadian greenhouse production. Uh, Mexico, actually, there's a, um, some difficulty there with uh, 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 importation laws. And so uh, Mexico is not actually penetrating the US market share of grafted production. They can't ship grafted transplants to the US or to Canada. 
So most of their transplant production is uh, in Mexico, uh, remains in Mexico. But we've seen a really large uh, growing interest in this kind of production and it's uh, rapidly scaling. Now, since there are so few nurseries and they're so far spread apart, it's really typical to see box trucks and trailers like the one picture here, transporting these large trans uh, transporting large numbers of these transplants. Um, typically that transportation time takes somewhere between three to five days from the nursery to the producer. And uh, according to a recent survey that up to 66% of these are without any kind of climate control. Uh, these uh, containers are, are stacked with transplants and then shipped across the, uh, the continent um, where they often have been reported to encounter types of chilling stress. This chilling stress can result in reduced transplant quality, as we can see here, of the necrotic tissue and chlorotic tissue forming on the leaves of these young watermelon transplants. Uh, and then once they arrive at the producers, they're often accepted and then transplanted directly into the field uh, with no, no additional hardening periods, and uh, we're going straight into the production cycle. Now, this can be an issue for a few reasons. Let me provide an example. We have plants leaving, perhaps Canadian nursery. They're shipped three to five days and they arrive in Southern Florida. If they're shipped without climate control, you can imagine how transplants um, in uh, February per se might have uh, a lot of chilling stress between that Canadian nursery and a Florida transplanting operation. Um, so we end up with this chilling stress and we end up with uh, seedlings going into uh, the ground with uh, uh, reduced quality. And that's um, a large problem for these producers as we can imagine that that vegetative growth is going to likely be delayed with this kind of damage. And then potentially that could uh, delay the fruit set and harvest of these crops, which could uh, really have uh, negative downstream consequences when growers are trying to plan out their production cropping cycle and trying to get a new crop in the ground and maximize the harvest of, of this watermelon crop. So uh, I designed a couple of experiments and I forgot to remove this text shadow, sorry about that. I designed a couple of experiments to look at this chilling stress. So I grew net grafted and non-grafted water, uh, watermelon seedlings. And then I uh, put them through a 72 hour or three day shipping simulation. Um, ship simulation meaning that I chilled them in growth chambers at set temperatures. So I have a lot of control over the amount of chilling that they receive. And then uh, once these um, transplants were chilled, I transplanted them to a greenhouse. So the first experiment was between zero and 48 hours of one degree Celsius chilling. Uh, after the end of that initial chilling period, they were moved into a 12 degree Celsius uh, growth chamber. And 12 degrees is known as a uh, safe storage temperature for these watermelon seedlings commercially. And so uh, we wanted to put them uh, through this uh, chilling simulation and then um, uh, back into a normal storage condition uh, for the entire, uh, the entire period. Um, for the second experiment that I'll talk about, I had up to 48 hours of chilling at temperatures between negative 0.4 and 1.2 degrees C. So even below that freezing point, just trying to enhance the amount of chilling in a more mixed capacity. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Once these transplants were chilled, um, I evaluated them for their uh, seedling health, visual appearance, and then um, also the percent of leaf area that was damaged. Uh, and then I also looked at the chlorophyll fluorescence parameter, FEFM, using this iris-3. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll get some of those results. But once these uh, evaluations were taken, I transplanted them into a greenhouse. And I assessed their vegetative growth and reproductive development over that time. So this is kind of what the greenhouse looks like. So I used a, a high wire cropping system that's really typical of commercial systems um, uh, for vining crops. Uh, you essentially hang a twine from a wire, and then you train uh, the vine up that wire. So this is kind of what it looks like towards the end of that production cycle. You can see there's a lot of uh, watermelon plants here growing up these vines. And I'll just jump right into some of these results. So right after the initial chilling period, and this is the one degree Celsius experiment, um, I looked at the uh, percent of leaf area damaged uh, uh, that showed damage. So either chlorotic or necrotic tissue, like you see on the left-hand side. Um, grafted transplants uh, uh, actually had more seedling damage than non-grafted transplants, likely due to the additional stress of healing from the graft just a few weeks prior. Um, but we can see there's a pretty linear increase in the amount of damage that's occurring uh, after this uh, chilling uh, exposure. And so we can imagine how this uh, may delay the vegetative development once they're transplanted into the field as these uh, 
uh, the photosynthetic capacity of these transplants are reduced. And so we have uh, a lot of issues there in uh, moving past that initial um, uh, uh, growth uh, uh, decline. So looking at chlorophyll fluorescence, um, FEFM is essentially a measure of the uh, photosynthetic capacity of the plant. Uh, and then uh, I measured these right after chilling in a dark adaptation period. Uh, and what we can see is we have a, a normal healthy FEFM ratio between 0.7 and 0.8 uh, with zero hours of one degree Celsius chilling. But as we add more and more chilling length, uh, we start to see a decline in the photosynthetic capacity of the plant. And we have up to a 10% decrease in uh, this FEFM important uh, parameter. Over the next few weeks, we looked at the reproductive growth in the greenhouse. Um, and in this case, I'm looking at days from transplant to the first female flower. The female flower is the one we care about the most. These are triplade watermelon. And so when these, uh, the male pollen is not viable, so the male flower is not as important to us in this experiment, but the female flower in the fruit set uh, uh, occurs um, uh, when this flower, a uh, picture on the left-hand side, is pollinated by a, a diploid watermelon. Um, and so this reproductive growth we see is uh, slowly delayed uh, with increasing length of exposure to one degree Celsius. Um, for grafted plants, this can be a delay of up to 3.2 days. And for non-grafted plants, this can be a delay of up to a week or so. Uh, and so the probably an important side note, the reason that we grew these in a greenhouse was to prevent the um, uh, crossing of any other types of abiotic stress that you might experience in the field. So due to growing in the greenhouse, I'm limiting any kind of weather conditions. I'm growing under optimal climate with optimal light intensity, um, but I'm avoiding uh, the uh, addition of other types of stressors that may uh, have interactions with that chilling stress. So this is purely just to look at the chilling stress itself. So um, we are successfully delaying the uh, female reproductive development. So we're going to delay fruit set and harvest uh, with this kind of um, uh, chilling exposure. And when we look at the, a little bit further at the chilling and reproductive development, I wanted to see um, what tissues were present at the time of chilling. So on the left here, I have just a cross section of a watermelon seedling. We can see the apical meristem uh, on the top here and then the forming flower bud to the right. And if I dissect and zoom in on that flower bud, you can actually see anthers in these 25 day old seedlings. So these will eventually develop into uh, viable flowers. Um, however, we think that the chilling is affecting the reproductive development in this seedling stage. Um, this information isn't very well understood for cucurbits or strawberry. Some stages of flower development uh, before they've bloomed into a flower are more susceptible to chilling stress than others. We don't really know that information for cucurbits. So uh, when we're chilling uh, these transplants at this young stage, we're seeing that these uh, reproductive buds are not uh, actually forming into full flowers. They are being aborted. Uh, and then later buds that are developed after the transplant are the ones that first uh, initiate flowering. So uh, we may be reducing potentially the yield of these crops by uh, chilling the early onset flowers and preventing that fruit production earlier in the season. And I believe that high temperatures and light might be key to both preventing this problem and then recovering from chilling stress. So before shipping, um, hardening the seedlings and advancing the flower stage to a stage that is less susceptible to chilling is one possible way to uh, reduce this uh, potential impact, um, uh, pot potential impact of chilling stress. Uh, also, once these uh, transplants are put in the field, um, high temperatures and light are going to advance that growth post-transplant and hopefully overcome the uh, seedling damage that we see earlier and uh, that we saw earlier in this uh, in this slide series. So once I looked at this uh, one degree Celsius theta, I thought you know maybe this is something that I can model as a cumulative uh, chilling stress response. So I'll provide an example here of uh, uh, another study looking at uh, post-harvest basal storage. Now this basil was stored in a cooler at various uh, temperatures. 10 degrees Celsius is a typical temperature that is used for storage. Um, and lower temperatures uh, uh, you can see are labeled here. And on the, excuse me, on the y-axis is an injury score. Above, at or above a level of five for this injury score, 
uh, is non-marketable, uh, but below a five is still a uh, is still marketable produce. So we want to keep the injury score below five, but we also want to know how much chilling these uh, basil these stored basil plants can take before we reach an unmarketable quality. So I thought this might resemble something like a thermal time calculation, which is uh, uh, in this case I'm going to express as chilling degree hours or CDH. So chilling degree hours uh, is essentially the sum of the difference of your base temperature, which is considered a safe temperature for storage, in this case, uh, like 10 degrees Celsius. Um, if 10 degrees Celsius is a safe temperature for storage, we're not seeing any chilling damage. We're just seeing natural uh, decline in post-harvest quality that occurs uh, somewhere around day five to six. We're just seeing the, the normal um, cycle of that uh, quality declining. So we think that 10 degrees Celsius is a safe temperature for this basal storage that isn't adding uh, or that isn't advancing the chilling injury to an unmarkable level. But these other temperatures are advancing it much more quickly. Um, so your difference from the base temperature to the actual temperature times the amount of time that those plants are under that condition uh, is how we calculate chilling degree hours. So just for an example, if 10 degrees C is safe, there are no chilling degree hours accumulated per actual hour. But if you have the temperature of nine degrees Celsius, you're probably accumulating about one chilling degree hour per actual hour. So for example, if I want to reach 50 chilling degree hours, uh, I could do so at nine degrees Celsius uh, for 50 hours or at eight degrees Celsius for 25 hours. Now this is the same figure as before, but I've transformed this data into the chilling degree hours with the base temperature of 10 and then fit that curve. Uh, so that injury score is still there on the Y axis. Sorry, we, we good to go? Okay. Um, so we can see here that uh, at that injury score level of five is occurring somewhere around 450, 475 chilling degree hours. Um, and if we want to, and that's the level of unmarkable quality. Uh, and so if we want to make sure that we stay under that level, we can just accumulate less than 475 chilling degree hours. But if I wanted to get an idea of uh, where this is occurring. Hold on a sec. Is this? Uh... There we go. Okay. Um, if I want to get an idea of how many uh, hours I can expose these plants to to reach that injury score of five, I could do that with 53 hours of one degree Celsius chilling or 80 hours of four degree Celsius chilling. And I should get approximately the same amount uh, of chilling injury in these, uh, in these stored um, basal plants. So I wanted to replicate this kind of idea with uh, the watermelon chilling stress I saw and with the different parameters that I've measured. So here's a figure looking at seedling damage again. So last time I just had the x-axis as zero to 48 hours of chilling. In this case, I have that mixed chilling and length of time. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it resembles more of an exponential function. But first, we have to select the base temperature that's most appropriate to represent this data. So I looked at base temperatures for all of these parameters between zero and 15 degrees Celsius. And then uh, once I uh, established those trends, I looked for the ones that had the uh, lowest p-value, the highest r-squared, or the lowest reduced mean square error. Uh, in this case, um, the appropriate base temperature was 15 degrees Celsius. So anything less than 15 degrees Celsius is going to accumulate chilling degree hours in this case. And when we model that, we can see that there's an ex exponential increase in seedling damage after about 600 chilling degree hours is accumulated. When we look at FVFM, I transform this again with the, using the best, uh, most appropriate base temperature, which in this case was three degrees Celsius. And then we see that in this data set, uh, the FVFM uh, uh, fluorescence parameter decreases 0 0.025 uh, with every 50 chilling degree hours accumulated using that base temperature of three. So, any temperature less than three degrees Celsius is going to accumulate those chilling degree hours in this case, and it's going to uh, have a really nice fit with um, the uh, reduction of that uh, total photochemical efficiency of this uh, of these seedlings. Uh, and in this case, it was up to a nine percent decrease uh, in uh, the FEFM parameter. Now, looking at female flower development in this uh, mixed trial. Um, we, uh, I've labeled here that the uh, best base temperature was actually found to be four degrees Celsius. 
So less than four degrees Celsius, we're inducing enough uh, uh, chilling damage to have a very predictable uh, result here. In this case, um, female flowering is delayed about 1.3 days with every 50 chilling degree hours accumulated. So to kind of tie these in together, these two studies, um, I'm pulling back the uh, one degree Celsius uh, female flower development. Um, and I've just uh, uh, made it come from uh, zero point at the y-axis this time to give an idea of how much delay is happening. And we can see here that with that increasing delay, you know, we have that delay between three and uh, seven days uh, for grafted and non-grafted plants. And then when I convert this uh, x-axis into a chilling degree hour uh, accumulation, we see that the uh, uh, CDH4, uh, the chilling degree hours with base temperature of four prediction, falls right in between uh, these two lines. So we actually have a rather close fit of uh, our predicted model versus the actual model um, that uh, occurred in the first experiment. There was a study that was conducted back in 2001 uh, looking at uh, watermelon transplanted into the field after chilling stress. Similar to how we did it, they uh, uh, put these seedlings under a two degree Celsius environment for up to 81 hours, and then mapped out how long it took for first flower development to occur. In this case, we have uh, somewhat of a similar trend as what we can see on the right. And when I plot their data over ours, we actually have a really, really, really tight fit um, of how much delay was expected uh, based on the chilling degree hour calculation. So uh, both our one degree C experiments with grafted and non-grafted plants, and then our mixed chilling experiment, which is the blue line, uh, and then the data for these two, uh, for these two years in that publication uh, all have a really tight fit. So we're really confident that um, this base temperature of four is appropriate and that chilling degree hours accumulated using that base temperature of four are going to predictably delay female flower development. So to conclude this, this first part here, the uh, watermelon transplants uh, suffer from seedling damage at less than or equal to 15 degrees Celsius. They have reduction in the important chlorophyll fluorescence parameter of FEFM at less than or equal to three degrees Celsius, which should delay vegetative development. It should Both of these things should likely contribute to vegetative development delay and then potentially reproductive delay. And then we did see that there's that delay in female flower development at less than or equal to four degrees Celsius. So um, when we transport these seedlings, uh, we should make sure that the long distance transport is above uh, four degrees Celsius to prevent any kind of uh, delay in the field. However, if those temperatures are experienced, we should take measures to limit the accumulation uh, of those chilling degree hours during transit. Now, this is about the end of my master's research, but I'm going to transition to a little bit of uh, my PhD uh, research talk here. Um, so I was looking at lettuce tip burn for indoor farms. Um, specifically, indoor farms have uh, uh, encountered this issue during lettuce production, and since indoor farms are mostly focused on leafy greens, anything that could potentially uh, damage the margins of these uh, um, uh, of these large commercial uh, producers is uh, uh, Going to potentially affect their bottom line quite a bit. Um, essentially, when unmarketable produce uh, comes through those uh, indoor farms um, with their high operating expenses and uh, the amount of labor required, uh, any kind of crop loss is really detrimental to the economics of these operations. The lettuce tip burn itself is the formation of the product tissue on the leaf margins or growing shoot tip of the full headed lettuce plant, and it's caused by a calcium deficiency. At the physiological level, uh, the cell wall is uh, upheld by a structure called pectin. Pectin uses calcium as a critical linkage component in the cell wall. And when pectin is unable to form, the cell wall begins to collapse and lose structural integrity. And this prevents uh, leaf expansion. This limits yield. Uh, it also produces uh, you know, some of an unmarkable quality. You can see here uh, just some light damage, uh, some light tipper on this uh, plant, but it does worsen quite a bit. And these plants don't look uh, these plants aren't very sellable. And so because of that unmarkable nature, often these crops are lost. So this tip burn issue is really just a supply and demand problem. On the supply side, uh, root pressure is one of the main drivers of uh, uh, calcium transport since calcium is an, immo an immobile nutrient. It has to be transported with water throughout the plant. Um, when we have 
uh, uh, what we have is a hydroponic system that I tested this in and most indoor farms operate off of and root pressure is maximized in that condition. Um, the other component of supply then is transpiration. And so that movement of water through the plant is driven by transpiration. And the more transpiration that occurs, the more calcium transport is going to happen. On the demand side of this equation is simply growth. So the growth rate is the biggest determining factor about how much calcium supply is necessary to uh, keep up with the, the growing demand of that crop. Once that supply falls below the level of demand, uh, we start to see tip burn symptoms appear rapidly. Just going to give you an idea of the time scale. When we transplant uh, these uh, lettuce seedlings, they grow at some of an exponential function. At the very end of the production cycle, we see huge, huge gains in yield of each individual plant. Um, however, this is also the riskiest, er riskiest area where we're likely to run into this tip burn problem. Um, so, if we want to, what we want to do is maintain and capitalize on the fact that we have this exponential growth but we want to limit the risk of tip burn in this period. Current strategies indoor, indoor farms to do this uh, and greenhouses for that matter are reducing the growth rate. So growing uh, smaller plants by reducing the light intensity or lowering the temperature um, or growing these plants for longer to reach the same size. However, that limits the amount of harvest you can have per year and also the size of the crop. Um, you can increase downward airflow uh, which actually breaks up the boundary layer uh, in that compact head. Uh, so just regular airflow in any direction will increase whole plant transpiration, but we want to target that meristematic tissue and those young leaves that need transpiration the most to get calcium where it's needed the most. Uh, and so downward airflow is a really effective solution to do that. Uh, foliar calcium sprays are also used, mostly in greenhouses. In indoor farms, we have a few issues with these things. For the reduced growth rate, we're reducing the profits. So that is affecting that that bar, that bottom line margin, and that's uh, a difficult thing to justify. Uh, increasing that downward airflow is difficult to integrate. You have to add fans in the narrow space above uh, the narrow aerial zone above these plants, um, and especially when there's rack systems used, it's really difficult to compete for that space with lighting and, and electrical components and the structures of the racks. Uh, and so this is a really difficult thing to integrate in a in a directional airflow way. Um, Calcium sprays uh, often can damage equipment. You're having water and salt spitting on uh, equipment can uh, be damaging to the structures and damaging to the electrical components. It can also reduce the yield of these crops. So the first thing I wanted to do was create a tip burn inducing condition post transplant. So I grew a uh, lettuce and under this condition uh, with uh, elevated CO2, really high light intensity, um, a rather high daytime humidity, um, and this is essentially to make this as fast a growing environment as possible. I also limited the airflow. So directionally, I had less than 0.1 meters per second of airflow in the horizontal and the downward vertical direction. Uh, and so this, this is the, the key component of what's going to uh, in, make sure that tipper happens in this condition, but the elevated growth rate is also uh, a major side of that. I also wanted to uh, not standardize, but a couple of uh, important tip burn metrics. Um, in this case, uh, there's a lot of different uh, ways to evaluate tip burn, um, uh, but I thought the best here would be the number of days from transplant to tip burn incidence, uh, and then also the percent of leaves with tip burn at the time of harvest. So getting a measure of both the incidence rate and the severity of these uh, of this tip burn. So, um, I, what I did was to evaluate the tipper inducing condition. I grew 10 different cultivars. I was able to induce tipper in all of them. Uh, and I think 86 and a half percent of all plants, uh, all individual plants did have tipper in through my four reps of this experiment. Um, and so we can see that uh, there's quite a, quite a range of the uh, tipper and severity percent of tipper and leaves on the Y axis. And then the cultivars here are listed on the X axis. Um, there are a couple of non-significant factors just to mention. Uh, lettuce morphology is one of the things that's been most linked to uh, tip burn risk or thought to be most linked. Um, uh, whether it's a butterhead, a romaine type, or a leafy type, um, I actually didn't see any differences in the uh, tip burn risk, uh, we'll say for any of those factors. Um, I also didn't see any difference in the lettuce color, whether it was red or, red or green lettuce, meaning high anthocyanin producing or not uh, lettuce. Um, 
and uh, those neither of those factors were significant in my analysis of uh, tip burn tip burn risk in the scenario. Um, now, seed companies do publish often uh, tip burn um, uh, tip burn uh, sensitivity. Sorry, there was a word. Uh, in in this case, it's really not consistent across different seed companies, so it's challenging for uh, growers to select uh, different cultivars, and they're not sure how much of a tipper and risk they have, especially when the different seed companies have different rating scales. Um, but the seed company that I, I source these seeds from does have a suggested production system, meaning indoor, uh, which is in green here, which means greenhouses or indoor farms, outdoor open field production, or both types of production systems. And I found that only the ones recommended for indoor uh, production had a lower tip burn risk. So it is good to know that they are that seed companies are selecting towards um, more tip burn resistant cultivars, but uh, and recommending them for use. But uh, uh, um, those recommended for other types of production systems may not uh, work very well in this fast growing, low transpiration condition. So now that I have the tip burn inducing condition. Uh, I want to figure out ways to manipulate that environment to reduce uh, that tip burn risk. So the physiology-based approach I chose to do this um, was opening stomates at night uh, of the lettuce to enhance transpiration. Uh, transpiration and uh, the uh, uh, stomatal conductance of leaves are uh, pretty linearly related at this level, meaning that for uh, if I'm increasing uh, that stomatal conductance, I'm also going to increase transpiration in a pretty linear pattern, which means I'm going to move more calcium throughout the crop. So uh, I did this by um, choosing the nighttime condition because we aren't adding to the growth demand, but I wanted to add to the calcium supply. So I chose to pick a light intensity of 30 micromoles, which is below the light compensation point. Uh, and then I chose to use 100% blue light uh, which uh, is reported to activate a phototrope in the guard cells. What this does is activate a proton pump, cause the guard cells to swell, and actually open the stomates. Uh, once those stomates are open, we're going to enhance that transpiration rate directly. And you can see just the spectrum here on the right side. Um, what this is doing is essentially increasing that movement of water and calcium throughout the plant. And ideally, what this is doing is moving uh, calcium to the uh, to the growing tissues and depositing it there for use once the daytime uh, resumes. There's also been reports that uh, that blue light effect can be enhanced by a small amount of red light uh, in many plant species. Um, this hasn't been tested for lettuce before, but I thought I would include it to uh, uh, see if that's if that holds true in lettuce production. Um, the same light intensity of 30 micromoles of light uh, but this was 80% blue and 20% red versus the other stream, which is 100% blue. So just to orient ourselves um, on the x-axis from left to right, and I'll preserve this, uh, this order is 100% blue light, then 80% blue and 20% red, and then that darkness condition. I'm only going to present one of the cultivars I tested for simplicity, but uh, essentially there were no yield change between these treatments, which is expected as I'm not adding enough light to enhance the growth during that nighttime period. There are also no morphological changes or growing habit change. Nothing, nothing uh, uh, odd happened with the lettuce crop. It looked just like a normally uh, normal producing crop under a normal day nighttime condition. Now, this is interesting here is, is when we're measuring leaf conductance. Uh, on the left side, we have the daytime conductance, which is very similar for all three uh, treatments. And then I'll zoom in here for the nighttime conductance. So. Most plants we know to have a nighttime leaf conductance less than 260 millimoles of water per meter square per second, uh, which is labeled here with this line. So most plants fall below that line. Lettuce in the dark nighttime condition has been reported as only 42 micro, uh, millimoles of water. Um, and we can see in our darkness condition here on the right side uh, that uh, actually 75 to 130 millimoles is what we measured. And so um, it's uh, likely that um, nighttime leaf conductance has been far underestimated in the past. And we're actually two to three times that amount, which means that we're having uh, potentially two to three times more uh, transpiration occurring from these lettuce plants during the nighttime, which has larger implications for things like designing HVAC systems. Um, uh, what we found with the two different light treatments was that 80% um, blue and 20% red was somewhat effective at opening 
stomates, but 100% blue light enhanced that leaf conductance uh, quite a bit. Um, oops, sorry. And uh, what we're seeing here is somewhere between you know 150 to 185 uh, millimoles. Um, so we're increasing that over that darkness condition quite a bit, and we're enhancing the transpiration there. Um, however, that blue light enhanced with that red light response doesn't seem to exist in this uh, in the lettuce crop, which is uh, I think the first time that we've um, uh, that's been analyzed specifically. Um, <clears throat> now, interestingly, even though I caused this experiment, and we should see an increase of transpiration, meaning an increase of calcium supply and reduction in tiprin uh, uh, symptomology, I actually didn't see any difference in tiprin incidence or severity in this experiment. And that's for a very good reason, I think. Um, uh, what we had was that low airflow condition. So I have this downward airspeed of less than 0.1 meters per second. To reduce tipper in indoor, indoor farms, the recommended airspeed is between 0.3 and 0.5 meters per second, directly downward to break up that, um, that boundary layer over the meristematic tissue and the, uh, uh, the young leaves inside of that compact head. Um, so my airspeed was, was, was far lower than uh, uh, was required to really, really demonstrate that this was an effective solution. Um, two things might come of this. One, I, I might be able to lower that airspeed requirement below that recommended value by uh, using that nighttime dim lighting. I also might enhance that transpiration uh, uh, more to make even more, uh, more tip burn, higher tip burn risk cultivars less risky to produce. Um, and we can see in this figure here uh, that I think is a is a good uh, figure to give an idea of what I'm talking about. As that stomatal aperture increases on the x-axis, we're seeing more transpirational flux, but it's still limited by that still air. Um, so in that experiment uh, from this this figure, that flux is limited by that boundary layer resistance because the air is totally still, meaning that even though stomates are more open. We're not seeing water move out of them because of that boundary layer preventing uh, that water from escaping. Um, once moving air is introduced, we see a, a really nice relationship between that increasing small aperture and that transpirational flux increasing quite a bit. Um, and so this, uh, for, uh, for this purpose, this is why I don't think I saw um, what I was hoping to see with that tip burn reduction. Um, but I'm going to be repeating this experiment with an airflow component to get an idea of the contribution of airflow, nighttime dim lighting, and the combination of the two uh, to, to really get a clear picture of whether or not this is going to be an effective solution for uh, folks in the future. Uh, so that, that concludes the, um, all of my uh, research uh, points that I wanted to talk about today. Um, if you wanna find this research, the tip burn research is being published soon. Uh, in the meantime, I have I do have some posters from previous uh, conferences up uh, on this uh, the website that's listed here, um, and then I have uh, the grafting research, uh, the grafting survey, and then uh, all of that research that I presented earlier is published, and so um, you're able to find it there uh, at these uh, various sites. And um, I just want to say thank you so much uh, to PP Systems and especially Carrie uh, for advertising this webinar and getting the word out. I really really appreciate it and. Um, if anybody would like to find me, you can find me at the various links, and then uh, you're welcome to follow up with me by email at any point. And so um, thank you so much uh, for uh, coming today, and I'm happy to take any any questions you guys might have. We, we've got some for you, and thank you. It was a great presentation. Awesome. And um, and what I'll do is I'll uh, when I send people the recording, I'll send mm -hmm. links to um, everything you just had in your presentation, as well as if someone wants to follow you on LinkedIn, Twitter, ResearchGate, um, so they can just mm -hmm. keep track of your research, because I'm sure there's more to come. Um, sure. We do have some questions for you. Um, okay. Ashley Hall is asking, uh, did the seeds that come out of these fruits have traits of both the grafted pieces? For example, if you grafted disease-resistant roots onto the stem of a disease-susceptible plant, do the seeds have disease resistant traits? Uh, yeah, so um, no. Uh, when we graft those plants together, it's, um, it doesn't actually impart any traits to offspring. Um, the other thing was that I was using triploid watermelon, which uh, naturally doesn't have viable pollen. So the seeds that come out of it are aborted. That's why the seedless watermelon doesn't have any of those uh, large black seeds that you got to spit out. They're, um, uh, 
basically they're just uh, uh, sterile, right? So um, when you graft these two plants together, they don't actually produce any different offspring. If I was growing a diploid watermelon that does produce, produce seeds and I had, had it grafted, it would just produce more watermelon seeds. It doesn't have any disease resistance traits, nothing like that, unfortunately. Um, that would be really cool, but uh, unfortunately that, that isn't how that, uh, how that happens. Okay. Um, did you determine the light compensation point through conducting light response curves for all types of lettuce study? I sure did. Um, yeah, so I, I used the light compensation point and I also used the specific spectrums that I was looking at. Um, and those were not, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the uh, different light response curves with the different light quality conditions. Um, and I did that with, actually with the Cyrus uh, and looked at that and I picked a a uh, light level that 30 micromoles is well below that compensation point. So it, I shouldn't be adding to the growth demand at all, which was uh, shown also in, the, in that the yield was the same across those three uh, treatments. Okay, great. Um, did you see a reduction in net photosynthetic rate with increased tip burn occurrence? Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, uh, so for the uh, tissues that were specifically damaged, so the that necrotic tissue, um, that's not photosynthetically active anymore, but the leaf uh, up to that necrotic tissue point actually doesn't have a, a reduction in that photosynthesis uh, that's, that, that I was able to measure. Um, there, are, there is some natural senescence of the leaves over time and, and those, those later uh, newer leaves uh, sometimes have a little bit of a different uh, photosynthetic capacity than older leaves do. And so um, there's, there's some interesting stuff there, but I didn't see any, any reduction in that rate, but if we're thinking about the overall plant, uh, any necrotic tissue is going to uh, uh, reduce the total photosynthetic capacity of the plant overall. Okay. Um, uh, did you study the stomatal opening in kinetic during the night or under the blue light condition? If not, when did you take your measurement? How many times after darkness or blue light exposition? Okay. Um, uh, so yeah, I looked at the model opening during the night uh, in darkness, right? So I had a treatment that was just darkness, no nighttime lighting. Um, I looked at the model opening then and with the uh, blue plus red light and with the blue uh, light. Um, I, uh, I looked at that actually two to three separate times over the course of that, that nighttime light exposure. So I only used that nighttime lighting during the last two weeks of production. Um, and during that time, I uh, I measured that it, it three to four times actually. So um, uh, that that was how I did. I think that answers okay. the question. Um, so we have um, Athena. I'm going to get this name wrong. Katulis. Uh, she says thank you for the presentation. Uh, she's also working on a grafted system, and I've just discovered. Mm -hmm scion mediated effects on the rootstock did you see anything like this in your plant models uh yeah so that's an interesting thing um there and uh there's a, a another student in my lab that's actually doing work on looking at the scion rootstock effects right now um and that's also like a large uh piece uh in uh, the grafting industry is that uh sometimes you do have uh, effects back and forth between the rootstock to the scion and the scion to the rootstock. And um, uh, it's not always clear. Some certain combinations of scions and rootstock, you'll see effects like that and some you won't. Um, and then also the performance of these grafted plants in different environments uh, uh, is uh, very variable. Um, and so that's, that's a, an area of a, a lot of research right now is exactly how those um, uh, you, you know, things like hormonal balance and things like uh, the much transport and um, uh, xylem formation. There's, there's a lot of components that go into that. And um, sometimes it depends on how high quality your, your seedlings were at the time of grafting. And sometimes it has to do with environmental effects or stress. And uh, any of those things can have an impact. And there's, there's lots of studies that are looking at um, that kind of stuff uh, today. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have any more questions from anybody before we let John go? Um, if you think of something later, we can certainly share that with him and, and he can respond. I believe our questions have been asked. Oh, 
no, nope, just lots of thank yous, <laughs> <laughs> which are always nice. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. But as as I said, um, if any questions come in to us after the fact, I'll be ha happy to share them with you. This was wonderful. We really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, and, thank you. This was a lot of a great fun. turnout. Yeah, I really appreciate it. This has been a great time. Um, thank uh, thank you everybody for attending. Um, and, and and like I said, feel free to follow up with me and my email or uh, online. I'm happy to talk with everybody. Yeah, so um, I will be sending out a link within the next week and it'll have that information just so people have it. I also put a link to your um, your watermelon grafting uh, paper uh, in the chat Thank for you. everybody, but I'll, I'll include that as well. And um, yeah, you did a great job. We really appreciate your time, John. Thank you so much, Carrie. I appreciate you organizing this. Oh, I was happy to, happy to. We'll be following what you're doing for sure. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, so just watch for that link, everyone, and um, and we'll see you the next time around. All right. Okay, thank thank you, you. Okay. Thank you for attending the webinar. Contact us today to learn more about the Cyrus 4 Portable Photosynthesis System, the fourth generation portable powerhouse elevating the high-level field research experience worldwide.